Turn on the CJs. CJs. Good morning, everyone. So good to see you today. Glad you join us from home. Let's all stand. The song is I'm a Friend of God. Here we go. Who am I that you are mindful of me? That you hate me when I call. Is it true that you are thinking of me? It's amazing Who am I that you are mindful of me That you hear me when I call Is it true that you are thinking of me How you love me it's amazing. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God.
Jesus. 
to see you guys here this morning. We know that the weather is horrible. Just look, oh, just put that screen back up there, Roy. Would you put it, do that? I want you to see how bad it's snowing outside. <laughs> it's snowing bad. He's going to put that up there in just a minute. But uh, <laughs> it's snowing out there like you wouldn't believe. And look here. See? I'm, it's coming down. And uh, anyway, <laughs> be it silly, glad you're here because, uh, man, I know it uh, took an effort to get up and get to the house of God this morning, and, and, and nobody expected you to brave that, but we really actually have a pretty good group here considering the circumstances. I hope people are watching at home either right now as I speak or maybe later in the day at some point. We hope you'll still worship with us there at home. We even have visitor with us this morning and in, in, in weather like this. So we're always blessed around here to see new faces and uh, <clears throat> just appreciate that. So we'll go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Let me just say this. I'll try to get you out of here in a timely manner today. David and I will. Uh, the weather is not getting better. It's not improving in the least. And so you're going to want to get home. There will not be any evening services. I was waiting until this morning to kind of make the call and just see what happened. And sure enough, we're going to need to cancel that evening service. So uh, you can just stay home and stay with your family and, and be warm. Okay, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in a word of prayer. And then we'll get right back to the music. Ben, will you lead us in prayer, please?
Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Lord God, we're so grateful uh, that you allow us. Every week, you give us a Lord's Day. We give, you give us a day to be in your house or to worship. Opportunity, Lord, to rest, be with our families. Lord, you've built this into our lives, and we thank you for it. Father, with the weather the way it is, there's not, uh, there's not that many people able to gather here in your house today, Father, but I pray that they'll be gathered in front of their uh, TVs or computers or wherever, worshiping with us across the land. And I just pray your blessings over each one of them as much as your blessings over those who are here. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you'd have your way in our services, that you would just give me uh, clarity of thought and clarity of speech and the ability to communicate this message. And Father, when we dismiss from here in a few moments, Lord, uh, that you would allow us to get home safely. Lord, there are people uh, with, uh, with difficulties in this weather, Lord, some uh, not fed well, some not sheltered well, some not even clothed well. So for those that are less fortunate, Lord, in our area and across the land, Lord, I pray that you would protect people's lives. And Father, we do thank you that you're in control. No matter what happens, there's nothing that uh, passes your, uh, across your desk, so to speak, without you allowing it. So Father, you've allowed this big storm. We're going to make the most of the worship hour. And God, we thank you for the privilege of gathering in your house. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 23, and I'll say once again, as I did just a few short weeks ago, uh, thank you for allowing me to kind of uh, dress down a little bit for the morning services. I, I, I said this morning I just uh, wanted to wear jeans and, and long johns uh, just to kind of, and, and I tell you, I'm very proud of these long johns and jeans while I was running that uh, bus route this morning. So indulge me, and, and I certainly have me no disrespect to the Lord's house on Sunday morning, but uh, it's, it's, it's a blessing to be warm. So Luke chapter 23, we're glad uh, those of you who are here uh, are here, and we're glad at home you're there and safe, and we want to uh, let the Word of God speak to your heart. Uh, again, we'll be fairly brief this morning, get you home, and uh, right now we're going to begin in verse Luke 23. You've heard me say this many times lately, how God is blessing our church, how we truly are uh, reaping a harvest, and now God's always blessed this church, and we've always had good things, but especially in spite of all of the obstacles that's been laid before us uh, the last year, the, the, the distractions, the hindrances, and the devil's attempts really to stifle the work uh, of the Lord, uh, God is still doing a great work in our church, as great as He ever has, I believe. 
And I, I, if I sound like a braggart, that's okay because I'm bragging on God. He's doing it. He's the one that's in control, and I believe He's rewarded and is continuing to reward our efforts to stay hooked, uh, to not get lazy, to be diligent through times when we even actually had the doors closed for a few short weeks there. We stayed at it, and God's blessing, and I'm thankful for that. Now, we baptized every Sunday now for several weeks. This morning we'll not be baptizing, uh, but we will pick up next week. A young man, a teenager, I, I led to the Lord on Wednesday night, will be baptized next week, and I trust we'll keep stirring those waters along as we go. So, uh, uh, anytime a person is saved, any person, any walk of life, anytime someone comes to Jesus for salvation, it is a monumental event. Uh, and we should rejoice in it. We should always, uh, what, what's taking place is a person's name is written down in the, in, in the Lamb's book of life, so to speak. They were recorded in heaven that they belong to God. And when we open our Bibles and we read about the various people who get saved in different circumstances, they're gloriously redeemed uh, in, uh, throughout the Scripture, that's exciting reading, or it should be. We should say amen when we read about each one of these people that are saved in the Bible. Uh, it's, it's, it's an exciting thing to see where a person is taken from darkness to light, taken from the temporal to eternity with God. I think about Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was in a sycamore tree when he first met the Lord Jesus Christ. I think of the Philippian jailer. jailer. He was in the middle of a jailbreak. Uh, when he met the Lord Jesus Christ. I think of blind Bartimaeus. He was on the side of the road when he met Jesus. The Roman centurion was actually standing guard over the very cross that Jesus was hanging on when he came to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's just to name a few. But one of the, perhaps one of the most dramatic displays of amazing grace is found here in our text as we uh, read about and uh, uh, study about the thief on the cross. We're going to begin in verse 32 of Matthew, or rather Luke chapter 23. And it says, and there were also two others. See, Jesus is, 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 has been tried and is, is uh, about to be crucified. There were also two other male factors uh, led with him to be put to death. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they were crucified with him. And the male factors, one on the right and the other on the left. And, uh, wow, it's, do you know what's going on there? Uh, uh, on the left. And then Jesus, then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also of them derided him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself. If he be Christ, the chosen of God, and the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar, and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription also was written uh, over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew, This is the king of the Jews. And one of the male factors, which were hanged, railed on him, saying, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answered, and rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing. And then look at this, folks, it's great. And he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto you, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. The men that were crucified on each side of Jesus that day were referred to here in this text as male factors. That simply means criminal or wrongdoer. If we were to look at Mark's account of this same event, they would be uh, 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 referred to as, as uh, uh, thieves. And that's not to imply that these fellows were just simple pickpockets or shoplifters or petty thieves of any kind, but rather they were likely robbers. They were likely uh, men who had committed aggravated offenses and were therefore considered to be a danger to society. So whatever the case is, whatever they had committed, they're paying for their crimes. They're within hours of stepping in to eternity. Now the question is, does that disqualify them for salvation? No. 
Does that, uh, uh, is it too late for them to be saved? No. Is, uh, has Jesus written them off as, as lost causes? No. In fact, we have here a perfect example of amazing grace. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, By grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If, if salvation involved any kind of man-made works, then it would have been over for these two fellows. If it had required anything for man to do to merit his salvation, these fellows would have been doomed. But that was not the case. We have to understand that Jesus has the power to save under any circumstances. And he has the desire to save under any circumstance. And I want you to consider this whole situation. Can you think of a case that would have seemed any more hopeless, any more desperate than the case of these two thieves? Pull this up on the screen of your mind and just view it for a moment. This thief that got saved was a criminal he was despised by society. He had been tried and convicted of his crimes. Now he's receiving the just punishment for those crimes. His hours here on life, uh, here in, in this life, are numbered. He's in excruciating pain. He has nails through both his feet and both his hands. He's elevated upon the cross, half naked, in public. His feet would never touch the ground again alive. If there ever was a soul that was hovering on the brink of hell, it was this guy. All seemed to be lost. All seemed to be uh, past recovery. Everything seemed to be gone. And, and, and it would have been if he had not been hanging next to Jesus. As fate would have it, this man happened to be within speaking distance of the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And as he hung there... He heard Jesus say those words, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He saw the divine display of grace that Jesus uh, gave that day. He, he witnessed the humility of Jesus, the submissiveness, uh, the submissive spirit of Jesus towards God the Father. And, and, and what he saw there on that cross that day was the evidence of the gospel. And he did the one and only thing that he knew to do the one and only thing that we can do when we realize Jesus is the Son of God. And he says in verse 42, he says, Lord, remember me when thou comest into the kingdom of God. Let me remind you of one of the most profound yet simplest verses relating to salvation that's found in the Bible. And it's Romans 10, 13. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What does whosoever mean? Let's break this down for a moment. Whosoever, that means anyone. Any age, any color of skin, male, female, rich, poor, short, tall, heavy, thin, it makes no difference. And, and by the way, that verse doesn't have a parenthesis that says except convicted felons. It doesn't say that. It says whosoever. Whosoever means anyone, just like it says. Put your phone up, please. Put it away, please. Okay? Whosoever means just that, anyone. And then it says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. To call means to petition and summon. The name of the Lord simply means the one who is in control, the one that's ruler, the one that's authority, the one that has dominion. And it says you do that, you call upon the name of the Lord, and here's the wonderful part, you've done your part by calling on the name of the Lord. The best part is God does His part. He always does. And He says you shall be saved. It doesn't say you might be saved. It doesn't say in all probability you'll be saved. It doesn't say with everything works out the way it needs to, then you'll be saved. It says thou shalt be saved. God wouldn't lie. He's going to do what he says he will do. So with Romans 10, 13 in mind, let's read verse 42 again. Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. I don't know of any more clear example in the scripture of a person calling upon the name of the Lord than this dying thief. He truly called upon the name of the Lord. And the results of that is verse 43, God did his part. He says, Verily I say unto you today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. 
that can, be wor- that can really be wrapped up in two words, you're saved. Well, really, three words, you're saved, buddy. <laughs> you know, it's just like Jesus says, yes, you called upon me, you're saved, buddy, and, and you're going to heaven. And, and it is, and it's so important that we realize that that's a hallelujah time, friends, when somebody gets saved. I think sometimes we miss that. If all the believers that were standing in the crowd that day at the cross would have understood what was taking place, the exchange between that one thief and the Lord Jesus Christ, they would have applauded. They would have praised God. But it's not likely that it sunk in. It's not likely that they really realized what was going on there. They, they, they just missed it. But you know, I think sometimes we miss it. I think sometimes we fail to realize how glorious it is when a person gets saved. Sometimes it just doesn't sink in. I don't think we realize the magnitude of the transaction of of, a person's sins being laid upon the Lord Jesus Christ and His righteousness being placed upon them. That's an exchange that is significant, if you will. Folks, that's not a ho-hum situation. That's not a, well, that's neat situation. You know what's neat? It's when you get to the bottom of the cereal box and there's a prize there. That's neat. Salvation is glorious. Salvation is a a wonderful thing. And I think sometimes we just fail to, and especially when we see a lot of people say, oh, well, so-and-so got saved. No, so-and-so got saved. You see what I'm saying? Been rescued from eternal darkness and transferred into eternal bliss. That's a big deal, friends. Jesus says in Luke 15, 10, He says, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Too often we miss out on the celebration that's taking place in heaven because we just don't pay close attention here on earth. If the angels are excited, then we should be excited. Uh, what, uh, let me read to you just a couple of verses here. Luke 10, 20, Jesus says, Rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Notice he says rejoice. Be excited. He doesn't say be ho hum. His name's jotted down. That's good. No, he says rejoice. Luke 15 and verse 6, he says, he says, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep which was lost. John 4 and verse 36, it says, Both he that soweth and he that reapeth shall rejoice together. So when we're doing God's work as a church, when we're sowing the gospel message, we're getting the word out, we're sowing the seeds, if you will, and then... We wait, and God does His work. The Holy Spirit of God deals with the hearts of people, and then we get the harvest. Is truly a time of celebration, a time of joy. It should make us happy. We should be excited. But like those standing around the cross that day, sometimes we miss it and we overlook the glory of it. You know, there was more involved here in this situation that you and I uh, than meets the eye. Some things that we might not have thought about. If you were to read Matthew's account of this same event, and we're not going to, you can read that both thieves, the one and the, on the left and on the right, both thieves were railing on Jesus that day. They were saying with the crowd, He saved others, let Him save Himself. Let Him come down from the cross if he, if, he, if, if he is the Son of God, and we will believe. They said, He's trusted in God, let Him deliver Him now. They were mocking Jesus right along with the rest of the crowd. You see, this thief that we're reading about had begun the last day of his life with an unrepentant heart. He started the day off wrong. But somewhere along the way that day, there was a change. There was a turning point. He went from ridicule and derision to respect and repentance. He had a change of heart. He had a change of mind. Sadly, I remember the days when I used to use God's name in vain. I remember the years of Sundays that I never gave God a second thought, let alone get up and go to His church. 
I remember joking and poking fun uh, uh, about uh, Christians, the goody two-shoe Christians. I had a buddy in college, I, I think of, in fact, I've called him a couple of times the last few years, uh, and, and, and I've actually apologized to him because he was, his name was Randy Autry, he lives over here in New Mexico, because he was doing his best during the college to serve the Lord in the midst of a cesspool of lost, rowdy friends who was bent on drunkenness and illicit behavior. And, and what we did is we teased him about going to church. Now, he was our buddy, and we weren't cruel in that sense, but he'd get up. There's a First Baptist Church right across the street from the college, and he'd get up and go to church, and we'd give him fits about it. It's embarrassing to even admit that. When a person's heart and mind is unrepentant, as mine was in those days and as yours was at one time. There's no limit to the depths of sin that we'll go into. Think about these two thieves. They're on the precipice of death, but yet they find within themselves an all-time low by hanging upon the cross and ridiculing the Son of God. That's the way it started out that day. But for one of them, the one we're reading about, suddenly there was some kind of eternity, eternal altering, if you will, change that came over him. When we read about it in this text, let's back up to verse 39. It says, And the malefactors which were hanged railed on him. One of them did. And he said, If thou be Christ, save thyself. Now what's the one that had the, the one we're reading about had had an unrepentant heart. Everything's changing right here. In verse 40, but the other one, thief number two, rebuked him this time, saying, Dost thou not fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. You see, thief number one, is still hell-bent on sinning against God and he's going to go into eternity apart from God. Thief number two, the one we're reading about, suddenly comes to a sobering realization. The first thing he had to have realized, he realized, hey, this is the Son of God. The second thing he must have realized is, I'm a sinner and my sins have caught up to me. The third thing is I'm going to die today. And I'm going to go into eternity. And the fourth and final thing he had to have realized was that there's only one hope for me. And it's this fella right here. The Son of God. And he called upon him. You talk about rejoice. Can you imagine? That fella, his day's been bad already. And he asked the Son of God, Remember me when thou come into your kingdom. And Jesus says, you're saved, buddy. Basically, you're saved. Can you imagine, in spite of all the circumstances of no, this deal's almost over. And I'm going to step into eternity. A soul has been redeemed and plucked from eternal darkness. It was just moments away, maybe perhaps minutes or maybe just a few hours away from him going into eternal darkness. Now something in closing here that I want you to realize, and everybody needs to understand this. This only happened for one reason. It's because that man put his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and called upon him. He had to put his faith. That's the only means of true salvation you see he never got off that cross alive he never had the opportunity to go to church he never had the opportunity to get baptized he didn't have the opportunity to establish a good testimony he didn't have the opportunity to start serving the Lord and doing things for God He never had the opportunity to walk with Jesus here on this earth. But yet he's still just as saved as you and I are. Isn't that grace? Isn't that amazing grace? He's just as saved. We're going to see this fella someday in heaven. He's just as saved as you and I are. Now let me get you to think about something. 
unlike this man that we read about, we have the privilege of walking with Jesus in this life. We had the privilege after our salvation to be baptized and tell the public we're not ashamed of Jesus. We had the privilege to be a part of his church, the privilege to serve, the privilege to uh, learn about, to worship, to praise, to follow, to emulate Jesus. That's a blessing, friends. It's a gift that you and I are allowed to experience, unlike this thief that day. Gloriously saved, but he never had an opportunity to know what it was to walk with God in this life. I wouldn't take for the 32 years of my life that I've been able to serve the Lord and experience the new life that he's given me. It could have been otherwise. The opportunity that God's given me to correct some things, to set some things in order, it's not been flawless and it's certainly been a lot of mistakes. But he gave me an opportunity to clean things up. He gave me an opportunity uh, to, to get a better testimony. Uh, most of you wouldn't know this, friends, but I had, well, you've heard me talk about it, but I had so much baggage, so much ugly on my life that I carried in this relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Just to give you a snapshot, and, and this is silly, but it's a fact. I had six outstanding tickets across the land when I got saved. I'm talking about with warrants for my arrest. By God's grace, I went and paid four of them within about two years after I got saved. The other two, let's just say I, I watch how I drive when I go through Amarillo. <laughs> Never got them taken care of, but uh, surely it's off the books now. I had two notes. One at one bank, uh, there's two banks in Clarendon and they're across the street from each other. I had one note at one bank and one note at the other that I defaulted on, just walked away from. By God's grace, he allowed me, and it took me four or five years for God to really get a hold of my heart, and I went back and cleaned those up and paid those notes. I had accounts, charge accounts at stores, that had debts that had been on the book for years. I had people that I had crossed people that I had, multiple people that I had wronged along the way and God gave me the desire and the opportunity to go back and clean those things up as best I could. I had a wife. I had never once had the privilege of coming home to a good man. I could go on and on about the contrast between before Jesus and after Jesus, but it's really not about me. I'm just saying we need to realize, Christians, the privilege we've been given to accept Jesus and then walk with Him, not that we're anything, but by His grace, see changes in our life, get a testimony of being a child of God. We get to experience all that. This thief missed it. Now, I praise God he got saved, and it's a glorious thing, and it is an amazing trophy of grace. And we should rejoice over every single Christian that comes to the Lord. But don't lose sight of the fact how privileged you are today to be in the house of God. How privileged you are today to be known in this community or wherever you live or within your family that you're a child of God. An opportunity to have a testimony. That's important, folks. Opportunity this next week. For this young man, he has the opportunity, the privilege to be baptized. My point of this whole message is, folks, two things. Never take salvation lightly. Rejoice in every single person of any age, under any circumstance. Rejoice over people being saved. Brother David, you can go. And number two, every day you wake up as a child of God, it's a privilege to walk with the Lord in this life and be known as a child of God. I'm going to ask you to stand. Maybe you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus. Maybe you're at home this morning and you're watching and you don't know Jesus. Let me tell you this. All it takes, you pick up the phone and call me and I can share with you what it means to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Or if you're here today, you're welcome to come to this altar and do the same. Maybe you just want to bow at this altar and thank God for the privilege you have of walking with Jesus in this life. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If God's spoken to you, you come.
says rejoice in the Lord and again I say rejoice I'm glad you were here this morning and again uh, be very very careful leaving out of here in fact I know some of these young men uh, here will be able to help some of you ladies get to your cars if you need uh, and just be safe going back we're not going to have an evening service this, uh, this evening obviously it's not improving out there at all and so uh, we will we'll just uh, be with our families Wednesday night be up in the air we'll wait till it gets a little closer the weather's supposed to be bad all week so we'll see how that plays out always going to have Sunday morning worship that's the policy just so you know to remind you if David and I have to get our snowshoes out to get up here and open the doors the doors will always be open on Sunday morning uh, and uh, you can know that don't expect anybody to jeopardize their safety uh, by getting out okay uh, let me encourage you uh, keep our people in prayer and here's what you need to know anybody at home anybody listening if anybody needs help during this storm please call me I've got four wheel drive I've got a lot of things to heat things up I can thaw pipes out I've, I'm set up for a lot of things just the nature of what I do I'll help anybody that needs it please call me but don't sit at home cold or uh, without okay because I will gather uh, my crew and we'll come help you okay all right unless you get stuck Aaron we're not coming if you get stuck <laughs> I'm just kidding you Aaron will you dismiss us in a word of prayer <laughs>